Coming up, the truth about the Mitsubishi Triton Ute bent chassis pandemic. <laughs> or otherwise. That's next. I'm John Cadogan from autoexpert.com.au and I get new cars cheap for buyers here in Australia. You can inquire at the website about that. Now, if you're watching this video, there's a fair old chance that you've arrived here after searching for something like Mitsubishi Triton Ute bent chassis problem or things of that nature. Google, YouTube, whatever, so good at cataloging this kind of thing. The internet, so prolific at everything, including uninformed opinion. So let us try to just get to the bottom of this alleged problem and help perhaps you out and certainly a dude named Tony. I just watched your rundown on four-wheel drive utes. To remind you, we have had other discussions on my purchase of a 2018 MQ Triton Exceed. I was and am particularly interested in the issue of weight loading or overloading the vehicle. I purchased my Triton for heading around Shitsville on the big lap, towing a medium-sized camper trailer and all the crap my wife will take along for the ride. And to Tony, I would say, mate, like it's your wife is going to overload the vehicle with cosmetics and napkins and doilies and changes of underwear or whatever. I'd suggest that recovery gear you plan on taking along with a shovel and a winch and things like that might contribute somewhat to the gross vehicle mass as well. Anyway, I'd further suggest that I recommend Triton and I have just put my money where my mouth is on this and actually bought one. I bought a Triton GSR. People are always asking me all the time, yeah, what car do you drive, mate? Like it's some kind of latest identity politics question. And the answer is, I just added a Triton GSR to the inventory and I've had for about 18 months now a Hyundai Santa Fe Highlander. And that experiment, money where your mouth is 1.0 if you like, has been running just fine. Hasn't missed a beat in 18 months. It's been great. And importantly, my wife loves driving it. So there's that. It is a very nice car and you know, very well equipped as well for the price. If you wanted an Audi Q7 with the same sort of features, you'd be paying like 130 grand for it. And I get that Hyundai's not Audi, but good enough for me and it's been fine. And it'll tow two tonnes as well. It's got adaptive cruise. It's great. Anywho, the GSR seems fantastic. I've only owned it for a month though, so pretty hard to tell at this stage, but it all adds up. The theory and the experience to date, totally fine. And I don't believe that there is any kind of design defect in the Triton or any other ute. However, I would suggest there is kind of an epidemic of outback dickhead. And it is easy to get any ute and make sure the load complies, right? You can, you can adjust this and that. You can adjust the payload to deal with the amount of load from the trailer. And you can do a lap of Schittsville if that is your thing in your acoustically transparent aluminium box with, you know, integrated shitter. If, if that's the way you roll, then happy days. But I'd suggest that the burden of dickhead is often excessive to any design attempt by engineers to make that vehicle robust, okay? The dickhead wins every time. Unfortunately, the ability to bend the chassis on Tritons is its Achilles heel. I'm reasonably sensible and after spending 11 years in the back of a furniture truck packing it in so it all fits, driving it to wherever and unloading it again has given me fairly good insight into loading a vehicle. Saying that, there is an awful lot of load space behind the axles. Google bent chassis Triton. I have a tub with canopy, so I guess I have a defined space to get all our crap in. So up front, I would say that Triton is not specifically predisposed to bending the chassis. I'd suggest that 
all Utes are kind of more or less equally vulnerable to this problem or at least susceptible, okay? So there is an inherent susceptibility to Utes. They have more or less a weak spot in between the back of the cab and the leading edge of the tray because, you know, in a vehicle with a separate chassis, the vehicle where the body is bolted onto the chassis and rubber mounted or something, then that contiguous body over the top of the vehicle does act as a contributor of sorts to rigidity in that longitudinal bending plane, that plane that's going to turn the vehicle into a banana this way or that way, whichever, if you get it all horribly wrong with the loading and in particular the dynamic loading that you might make the vehicle experience out there on some, you know, dodgy road in the outback. So not specifically a Triton problem. In fact, if you Google in the image domain bent chassis Triton, you will find one. Here's one now and another <laughs> and another. And I have to ask you, does any of this look like a good idea, even remotely like a good idea? It reeks of overloading, dynamically overloading, right? But if you Google bent chassis Triton in the image domain, you will also see this. And pretty clearly, Navara does this, early spec and late model Navara. And this ute that I haven't identified, mainly because I didn't try at all, but not a Triton because the rear of the cab is the wrong shape. And even the mighty Schittsville Humvee is susceptible to bananaization in this way. <laughs> Anywho, Tony goes on. In your report, the only con against the Triton you mentioned was this overloading issue. You mentioned in particular that towing something over large distance over shit roads was probably not a good idea in a Triton. Well, I'd suggest that it's probably not a good idea to get close to the limit on a long trip in an unforgiving situation in any vehicle and certainly in any ute. And you have to be realistic about what these vehicles actually are. So let's go back and think about the way engineers design vehicles and the limits that they impose upon them because you can look at the limits in the specifications and draw entirely the wrong conclusions. Let's start with this, okay? In a Triton GSR, you've got 901 kilograms of payload capacity and you've got 3.1 tonnes of tow capacity. And I'd suggest that you should never get a 3.1 tonne trailer and hitch it to a Triton and put 901 kilos of load in the tray or in the cabin and the tray, combination of both, whatever, because that would be overloaded. That is a bad idea. Certainly you can tow 3.1 tonnes and certainly you can carry 901 kilos of payload, but you can't do them both at once. And this is a really obvious example of where limits do not overlap. They're like a Venn diagram with the intersecting bit in the middle here is like, don't go there, all right? And I'd further suggest that if you're going to tow something really heavy, you can have some payload in the vehicle because obviously your own very fat ass and the fat ass of everyone else in the vehicle has to come along. Otherwise, the vehicle's not going anywhere. You have to carry some stuff in the vehicle. I get that, but you can't overload it. And you have to think about the nature of the roads that you will be driving on at the time because Driving up a freeway close to a capital city is a very different experience than driving up some dodgy dirt road that gets washed out by a wet season once a year or something because on a freeway close to a capital city, you are hardly ever going to be engaging the bump stops in the suspension, which would be where the axle reaches up and nudges the chassis and the only thing in between is a hard rubber block to stop <laughs> disaster. That's not going to happen on the freeway, happens all the time in the outback. So if the vehicle is heavily laden, close to the limits in that kind of situation, you're opening the door to a disaster much more than if you are close to the limits on a nice civilised freeway where someone can drive their Mazda MX-5 with impunity, okay? So 
what you've got to say to yourself is that the closer to the limit that I get in any one domain is going to have implications for things like reliability and exposing the vehicle to the risk of damage in other domains. And for this reason, I would absolutely advise you to be completely conservative when it comes to what you tow and what you carry in vehicles such as this. And do not be seduced into the mindset that you're owning a tough truck because that's really not what this is, okay? All of these utes are sort of medium duty utes, right? And there is a whole physics tutorial we could do on why these failures happen. And let me know in the comments below if you would like me to get into that because happy to do the beer garden physics of you chassis bananaization. That would be like right up my alley. Hi, I think you'd agree. But let us move on, shall we? Because Tony has more. What to do? This is exactly the purpose we purchased this vehicle. Is the problem more along the lines of people carry way too much much unnecessary crap and their ability to correctly load a vehicle substandard is the Triton the right car for the job interested in your thoughts okay so can you get a Triton and use it for extended touring around this fine island continent of Shitsville yes yes you absolutely can you can do it safely the vehicle will return intact if you get it right this issue is really about you know dickhead behind the wheel or not even behind the wheel it's dickhead thinking about the use of vehicles okay and i'm not trying to be like let's get the gloves on and really slam this home about dickheads okay you can unwittingly be a dickhead nobody's expecting you to be an engineer let's say you've been an accountant your whole life and you want to do the big lap of shitsville and you're buying a vehicle and you're buying a camper trailer, whatever, and you're putting stuff in it and you want it to do that stuff. It's very easy to be a dickhead and you could apologise for someone. I'm, I apologise on behalf of you for being a dickhead because you had no idea. You're a, a dickhead with mitigation, you know. You're not like aggravated dickhead. <laughs> you knew this was wrong and you did it anyway. You're like unwittingly a dickhead. That's easy. People do it all the time. Same bananaization of the friggin' chassis. Same problem out there, hours from support, in the middle of nowhere with 45 degree heat, like <laughs> down on top of your head. You're going nowhere. There's not going to be a car coming past anytime soon to help you out. No cell phone coverage. Oops a daisy, right? So there's that about being a dickhead, okay? Same problem. But evidence in mitigation, no problem. And these are at best, let's not forget, medium duty vehicles. All of this advertising and marketing about how tough these things are and the shots of them, you know, being flogged over all kinds of terrain, jumping sand dunes and thrashing the outback into submission. Okay, but it really is hyperbole. These vehicles are medium duty off-roaders and load carrying towing platforms at best. So, at the risk of undoing millions of dollars worth of marketing, that's what you're buying. And you've got to treat it like that if you want to go out there and, importantly, come back. And I'd suggest here that heavy towing is the riskiest undertaking for bananaization. okay? It really is because when you think about it, and without wanting to subvert any knowledge that might be forthcoming in a beer garden physics tutorial, you've got a leaf spring at the rear in most vehicles like this, not Navarro with the high spec, but anyway, you've got a leaf sprung suspension at the rear with a solid rear axle, okay? Leaf springs are really good because the chassis, remember, cannot see what's below it or what's above it. It only knows that there are loads imposed at particular points. And the loads are imposed on top at particular points where the cross members are that support the tray, okay? And they're supported by the points on the chassis that anchor the leaf spring. So the reactive support for the loads, axles here, the two points on the springs are here, they push up like that, everything's hunky-dory. The other part of load imposition is the tow ball, okay? And the tow ball is 
hung off a dirty big piece of steel or some pieces of steel. There's a cross member and a, a cross member that gets added as an accessory and then there's a hitch that hangs off the back with a tow ball on it. And that load is cantilevered a hell of a long way from the rearmost leaf spring anchor point on the chassis, right? So it's got the ability to impose a hell of a bending moment because you've got two reactive supports here and a big fat load here. And it can be amplified tremendously by dynamic loads. And I'll give you just like one horror scenario, okay? You say Triton, 3.1 tonne tow capacity or Ranger, whatever, three and a half. Then you put a 3.1 or three and a half ton trailer on the back with your 300 and something kilos worth of download, that's static download, and then you trundle off on the big lap of Schittsville and you get to a point, everything's going fine, right? And then you get to a point where you didn't see a wash away in a bit of a dirt road and you're in the wash away and all of a sudden you're reacting to it, so you hit the brakes a little bit to reduce your speed and the rear axle is already in the wash away. The front's already past it, but the rear has just thumped down into the wash away. Then it's travelled forward in the wash away a bit and you're on the ramp or the gutter, if you like, to get back up onto the road. So the rear axle slams into that gutter and it pushes dynamically. The whole thing comes up, massive reactive load upward on those two leaf spring anchor points, on the chassis, okay? And at the same time, you're on the brakes, so the trailer is sort of pitching forward, dynamically imposing a greater load on the tow ball, and then the trailer thumps into the wash away at exactly the Goldilocks wrong moment, and there's a massive downward dynamic load on the tow ball from that, like, <laughs> yes. And what do you reckon is the result of that? It's bananaization, okay, because there's this big download at the same time as there's an upload here and then the chassis wears it in the weakest point, which is between the cab and the tub tray, whatever, okay. That's where it bends. You've been bananaized. It's a major problem in the middle of nowhere and there's nothing you can do. You can't fix a problem like this in situ, okay. It's a disaster, Okay, so heavy towing is a big problem, right? And I want to talk to you about exactly how easy it is to overload these vehicles, right? Because you might buy a Triton and go 3.1 tonnes. Yes, I'll tow that. I'll show you how easy it is to overload the vehicle, right? Because you've got all this stuff that you want to put in it. And just to put this in context, Triton GSR has a gross vehicle mass of 2.9 tonnes and it's got a curb weight of 1,999 kilos and if you subtract the tiny one, the curb weight from the gross vehicle mass, you get 901 kilos of payload, right? That's what you've got to play with, yeah? And I'd suggest that you need to make this bookmark in the back of your head that the tow ball download, the static tow ball download of the trailer pushing down on the tow ball is part of that payload. It's part of the GVM, therefore it's part of the payload because payload is part of the GVM, okay? And I've made up these estimates, what you might allow from a loading scenario. And I'm not gilding the lily here, although I have massaged them a little bit just to make the point, okay, to make the data fit. So I've said that a tow bar is going to be 40 kilos. A tow bar is an accessory. It's not counted in the curb weight stated by the manufacturer. you got to add it. So 40 kilos there. And I'm suggesting that we allow 100 kilos for a driver and 80 kilos for a passenger. Okay, so if you're a carnivore and you're good on the tooth and your missus is likewise, then hey, it's probably going to be about that. And maybe you don't weigh 100 and maybe she doesn't weigh 80, but you know, you're not going to drive around Australia the whole time, well, not the whole time, nude, are you? You're going to wear clothes and you're going to carry personal stuff in the cabin. So 180 kilos for you and your lovely wife, probably not over the top. You're going to have some equipment in the cabin as well, aren't you? I mean, I would. I'd have equipment in the cabin, right? And I'm going to allow... 80 kilos for that because you've got a whole second row back there in a dual cab ute and you're going to put stuff in it, okay? So you might want to have, I don't know, a sat phone. I made a list. First aid kit, EPIRB, 
esky, a few personal items, you know, in my case, I'd take a full set of hair rollers and a brush and, you know, some conditioner and shampoo, just in case, and your normal EDC stuff that you carry on yourself, a Leatherman and maybe something to start a fire with if you if you get stuck in the middle of nowhere, whatever, okay? And you've got to treat this a little bit like um, a tactical loadout with the vehicle, haven't you? Because you might decouple the trailer and go off on a little exploratory jaunt somewhere. You might leave the trailer somewhere safe and go four-wheel driving. And if disaster strikes, you've got to at least have uh, the tactical loadout stuff that is going to support you if you get stranded, help you fix the car. It's got to be with you in the ute at all times. You don't want to keep reconfiguring that because it opens the door to you forgetting something critical. So there's that. Cabin equipment, 80 kilos. You got a canopy on your ute, or at least Tony there has a canopy on his ute, and I don't know how much they weigh because ARB and TJM and all these other canopy manufacturers don't actually state the weight of the canopy in their specs, which I think is a bit of an oversight because if you're configuring a vehicle, you'd want to know what everything weighs so that you can add it to the curb weight so that you don't drive around Australia over friggin' loaded. So there's that. Second spare tyre. Maybe 30 kilos for that, 66 pounds or something. Doesn't seem unreasonable, particularly if you've got some big, fat, chunky off-road tyres. And uh, let's say you've got 40 litres of fuel in two jerrys and 40 litres of water. And maybe you can get away with 20 of each of those. But I'd suggest the default size of a jerry can is like 20 litres in most cases. And you'd want to carry two. And you'd want to carry two for redundancy, okay? Because if you ever need them, it's really bad to discover that your jerry can's been rubbing up against something for the past thousand Ks or something, and it's actually perforated the jerry can down the bottom and your diesel has leaked out all over the tub and is useless and gone, okay? That's bad. Same with the water. So if you carry two containers of each of those things, then you've sort of halved the risk of being sidelined and that support stuff being completely unavailable. So 40 litres of each of those things, 40 kilos a piece for a total of 80 kilos of fuel and water, then maybe 30 kilos of tools and spares, 25 kilos of recovery gear. And it's pretty easy to get your recovery gear up to 25 kilos if you put in a hand winch, a couple of shackles, you know, a snatch strap, a shovel, just the basics, a bit of checker plate to put the jack on so that you're not just you know, jacking down into the mud or the sand when you need to lift a wheel instead, right? And then you're going to have a bull bar. I mean, you can't join Club Outback Bogan without a bull bar. So 60 kilos for that, even without a winch, that's about what a bull bar is going to weigh. Second battery for the vehicle, 20 kilos there. That would be a safe estimate. Roof rack, 20 kilos there. You might put a, an awning on the roof rack. That might be, I don't know, another 20 kilos for that. A solar panel with a bit of a f uh, frame around it mounted onto the roof rack. Have to allow 10 kilos for that. A few miscellaneous accessories, right? 30 kilograms, kilograms and kilograms for a UHF radio that you might mount into the vehicle and a big fat antenna up the front, some lights, a battery isolator, a snorkel, another one of those club outback bogan must-haves that is essentially useless unless you're going to be driving through a really deep river. A compressor and tyre repair kit, maybe eight kilos for that and maybe a fire extinguisher for eight kilos. And I'd suggest that if you are driving a dual cab ute, you'd want to have some of this stuff in a go bag just behind the driver, as in right on top of everything else, on the seat, ready to go, okay? You need a fire extinguisher because if you're out there in the proper remote outback and your vehicle catches fire because, I don't know, a whole bunch of dead grass has built up around the exhaust pipe and caught fire and you've only just figured this out, then you're going to have to fight that fire. You're going to have to do it rapidly, okay? Because if the vehicle burns to the ground, not only do you lose your mobility, but you lose every item that could help to support you in a scenario where you've got no mobility. So a go bag is a really good thing to have, as in jump out, open the back door and go, 
right? And it's got to have all of that stuff that you might need for emergency support, like a sat phone and your e and some water and the friggin' fire extinguisher. And the fire extinguisher would want to be super accessible because seconds count in these situations, right? If you want to save the vehicle. And you need a first aid kit in your go bag, right? And you need shelter because without water and shelter, survival in extremely hot conditions in Central Australia the, the chances of you surviving are extremely diminished without something to communicate with the outside world. You've got to think about this stuff and hardly anyone does. I guess if you've been in the military or you were a Boy Scout, maybe you just get wired differently. I think about this stuff like that all the time. You've got to be ready for the worst case scenario. So let's just think about all that stuff. And the reason I went through it in detail is so that you can say to yourself, Am I being reasonable or am I being unreasonable in my estimates for these loads? And have I compensated fairly for anything that I might have unwittingly left off this list? Anyway, if you add a two-ton trailer to that load that I just mentioned on this spreadsheet, right, you are up to 901 kilos of payload, right? That's a two-ton trailer. It's so conservatively under the limit for towing right? I'm suggesting a two-ton trailer with 200 kilos on the tow ball. And the 200 kilos goes in the payload. And if you add all those preceding numbers up, 901 kilos. If you've got a 200, uh, sorry, if you've got a two and a half ton trailer on the back with 250 kilo download, you're 50 kilos overloaded, right? And if you've got the full works burger of 310 kilos on the ball from your 3.1 ton trailer out the back, then you are 110 kilos overloaded. And a great deal of that is like a quarter of the total payload is hanging right out the back where it is ideally placed for dynamic bananaization of the vehicle in a worst case scenario, hitting that worst case washout, right? So you've really got to think about what are you going to take and what are you going to leave behind? Because unlike what ARB and TJM and all of these other four-wheel drive accessories joints will tell you, there is a virtue in minimalist off-roading, adventuring, whatever, touring. The more you add, the more it opens the door to exactly this kind of disaster. So you have to say to yourself, am I going to live without the bull bar? I'd suggest not trading in your missus for red-headed named Tiffany, boss's secretary type, because you're probably only going to save 25 kilos and she's not going to be receptive to caravanning anyway. Trust me on this. They're just very hard to please typically in the long term. Anyway, you've got to just really play this game with loads and talk about the virtue of minimising these loads, right? And there's a final point I'd like to address here from Tony just for completeness, okay? And it plays into what accessories to fit and what not. On another issue, you mentioned bull bars recently and said a defensive driving course is better value than a decent chunk of steel up front. I disagree with you most wholeheartedly on this point. I have driven all manner of trucks over 40 years and had a number of close calls with animals of all types. If a dumb chunk of chuck steak wants to make it with the female version on the other side of the road, nothing will stop it. The one thing I can agree with Tony here on is that, yes, the drive to mate is quite strong, isn't it? I, I guess we all feel it from time to time, even at my advanced age. Anywho, on everything else here... I disagree. And what I would suggest here is that there's a time for opinion and there's a time for the facts, okay? And you are entitled to your opinion about things of this nature, but only if you can substantiate it with facts, okay? By argument, using facts. And on this, I don't believe you can substantiate this opinion about bull bars being better than advanced driving. And specifically what I'd say here is that we're in the domain of conflicting priorities when it comes to bull bars because the objective of a bull bar, apart from, you know, joining Club Outback Bogan and having the right fashion accessory, the point of a bull bar is to protect the vehicle against animal strike. And when you say it like that, you go, yeah, okay, I, I haven't got a problem with that because if the alternatives are protecting the vehicle or not, then I'll go with protecting the vehicle. But we really are in the domain of conflicting priorities because 
the feedback effect of fitting a bull bar, which most people never consider, is that you may compromise the safety of occupants in a more serious crash, okay? I don't want to save the vehicle and end up dead in a serious crash. I don't want to save the vehicle from hitting friggin' Skippy and end up dead because the bull bar spoiled the deployment of pretensioners and airbags and all of that high-tech stuff designed to save your life in crashes that would otherwise kill you. And I'd suggest that bull bar manufacturers have really not made the case in any concrete way that their bull bars do not compromise the safety of vehicle occupants. They're not required to do this by legislation. There's no regulatory standard for bull bars, of which I am aware, that involves crash testing to compliance standards or, you know, ANCAP safety type standards. There's no hominid dummies being used, to my knowledge, in the bull bar domain. And there's no proffering by them of this data. So just to paint this in stark perspective, okay, if you are in a serious crash, you have a clipping head-on collision out there on the highway, then the vehicle starts to decelerate rapidly. The structure of the vehicle begins to interact with the structure of the other vehicle. You might run off the road and hit a tree and the structure interacts with the tree. And as a result of that interaction, energy is absorbed and you start to decelerate rapidly. And once you reach a predetermined threshold of this controlled crushing that is designed into your vehicle, then the crash sensor fires off and all of that precise choreography, right down to the millisecond, it goes off to save your life. The pretensioner drags you back up and eliminates the slack in the seatbelt and it's got load limitation built into it. It's very, very clever indeed. And the airbag fires at a precise moment so that when you hit it, 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 your interaction with it is optimal. And the details of this interaction matter. They matter right down into the millisecond domain. So it seems to me that if you put a big chunk of steel, which a bull bar is invariably, right on the front of the vehicle, then some of that interaction that is programmed in, if you like, for normal crashes is altered in some way. And it may be significant and it may not be significant, but I'm not happy to roll the dice on this because protecting the vehicle to me is just not as important as protecting me. The scenario I want to avoid here is the one where the rigidity of the bull bar and its installation on the car changes the nature of the way the crash sensor perceives the crash and causes all of that stuff to fire off too early because the initial part of the crash is not as soft as it is supposed to be. Because the bull bar, by definition, is anchored further back in a much more rigid way to a much more rigid part of the vehicle's structure. Okay, And I'd suggest that if this were absolutely robust in an engineering perspective and bull bars did not alter that crash in any way, that there would be all kinds of crash tests done by all kinds of bull bar manufacturers to advertise this fact. Okay, And this stuff obviously is not in existence. If it is, I have never seen it. And Let's not forget, ARB, for example, is a publicly listed company. It's got huge resources. If it wanted to go and buy half a dozen, I don't know, 200 series Land Cruisers and put bull bars on them and drive them into a barrier full of hominid dummies just to prove a point, then they've got the resources to do that. And they haven't, not in the past 20 years. And this has to be for a reason, because they know what would happen, possibly, and they don't like it, or because there's no regulatory apparatus compelling them to do that and they think they can get away with it from a marketing point of view because, you know, we can talk about protection and toughness and safety and all that stuff and just sell it out there to the masses who've never had very much technical training. So that's really what I would seek to avoid, right? I don't want my safety in a serious crash compromised just so I can protect the vehicle in a crash that really is not that dangerous to me personally, but which might significantly damage the vehicle. And let's face it, it's going to add another 60 or 80 kilos to your vehicle. And as we've just seen, you can ill afford to add any mass to a vehicle such as a ute that you don't absolutely need to add. So the stuff that you need, yeah, it's in. But anything that's optional 
why don't we examine that rationally and go down the track, literally, in this minimalist add-on and carrying sort of scenario where the vehicle is intrinsically more protected from all kinds of dynamic events that you cannot foresee except to say that they are likely when you are undertaking something as ambitious and long-winded as a big fat lap of Schittsville. That's all I've got for you right now. Don't forget to let me know if you want to do the beer garden physics of bananaization because quite happy to do that if there's interest and let me know. And Think carefully about what you put in these vehicles, okay, because while it's easy to keep adding and while lots of companies can tell you, yeah, it's a great idea, this will do that and this will do that and that will do this, ultimately there has to be a limit and many Outback tourers are well and truly over it. Thanks very much for watching. 